Hey everybody, I hope everybody is doing well. This is Wednesday, March the 18th, and this is a video devotional. Um, this is my first video devotional, my first video anything. Um, and so it's a little different for me. It's kind of out of my comfort zone, but I want you to know that this is an act of faith. Yes. Um, and so before we get started, um, in this brief devotional from Acts chapter 27, so get your Bible ready, Acts chapter 27, uh, let me toss out a couple of reminders. Uh, just remember that tonight, obviously, we will not be having church. Um, there will be no activities, no events going on at the church tonight. Um, additionally, as you probably have already heard, we will not be having church this Sunday. Um, we have not made a decision about next Sunday, um, but we will not be having church this upcoming Sunday. But we will, and this is very, very important, and we will have a live streaming worship service on YouTube this Sunday at 1030. I repeat, we will have a live streaming service on YouTube, our ERBC YouTube channel, at 1030 this upcoming Sunday. And then that video will be posted to Facebook and other um social media platforms. So please just remember these and we'll have uh, some more announcements later on, probably in the week or uh, on Saturday. And so before we begin, I just want to um, give you a heads up. I will not be mentioning, not one time, not one time, uh, because I think we need a break from that. I think we just need to hear from God's word um, during this devotional. So let's pray. And then we'll head right to Acts chapter 27. I'll give you kind of the background of what's going on, and then we'll read. It's going to be a lengthy passage, so get your Bible out and follow along with me. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we pray um, in the name of Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you'll bless this time that we have, even through the medium of video. And Lord, I pray that you'll encourage us. Lord, I pray that you will put good courage into us, in the name of Jesus, through the ministry and the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you will um, bring peace to the hearts of the saints at Edwards Road Baptist Church in tumultuous times like this. I pray, Lord, that you will give us wisdom, give us discernment. Father, I pray that you will give our president and those that are dealing with the crisis um, in our country right now, I pray you'll give them great wisdom, great discernment. But Father, I pray that you'll be glorified I pray that you'll be honored, you'll be exalted in all of this. For, Father, you are in control. You are sovereign. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. What's happening in Acts chapter 27 is, just to give you a little bit of background, um, the Apostle Paul in chapter 24 has been accused of sedition. And because of that, Paul is brought before the governor of Judea, Felix, and then subsequently, he is brought before the governor of Judea uh, that succeeded Felix, Festus. And then after Festus uh, quizzes the Apostle Paul and hears his case, um, he is sent to um, Herod, uh, Agrippa Herod II, and uh, Agrippa was the last of the Herods. And just to make a long story short, you can read this in the book of Acts, because Paul appealed to Caesar um, Agrippa sends him under guard to Rome. And that's where we pick up in Acts chapter 27. We know that Paul was probably um, under guard. Uh, we do see here in verse number two that Paul was accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. And so we believe that this was a member of the church of Thessalonica. Um, and so Paul begins his journey to Rome uh, via boat. He's leaving on a boat to go to Italy from Macedonia. And so I just want to pick up reading in verse number 9. And we're going to read quite a bit. And so I just, I just want you to follow with me, and let's just read the Word of God together. All right? He says, Since much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast, or the Day of Atonement, was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. 
But the centurion uh, paid more attention to the pilot or the captain of the ship and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there. And on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, the harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing they had obtained uh, their purpose, they weighed anchored and sailed on to Crete close to shore. But soon a tempest wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island named Cotta, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on uh, Sirtis, they lowered the gear and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of being saved was at last abandoned. It's very important. Verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on some island. This is the word of the Lord, and I pray that he'll bless the reading of his word. The reason why I picked this passage, interesting passage, is because it contains two truths um, that we have heard uh, a lot about the last couple of weeks. Uh, number one is that God is in control. God is in control. Um, there is no doubt about that from Scripture. And um, He is sovereign. Uh, if you look up the word sovereign in the dictionary, in the old portable large print Webster dictionary, um, you will find that sovereign means chief. It means supreme. It means independent. God is chief. He is supreme overall. He has no equal. Um, it is important that we understand the word independent. God is um, independent. He is not dependent on anything for his existence. He is not independent on anything for his wisdom or his sovereign plan. Um, he's independent. And so the first thing we need to see this, this afternoon is that God is in control. Now, the second thing is, in my handy-dandy slide up here, is we are responsible. Even though God is in control and even though God is sovereign, we are responsible. Um, we are be, to be obedient because sovereignty does not release us from the responsibility of being obedient. It does not release us from the responsibility of being responsible. Nor does obedience and responsibility say that we are in total control of our lives because we are not. And what this is in Acts chapter 27, God is in control and we are responsible. It is that ongoing, mysterious, beautiful truth that God is sovereign and man is responsible. And so Paul is sailing to Rome and it's not smooth sailing as we have read. And I just, I just want to go back and I want, I want to reread verse number 10. Um, he says, sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. The first thing that jumped out to me, or jumps out to me in this passage, um, is Scripture is very honest about life, about the Christian life. Um, in this passage, Paul is not delusional that uh, this would be kind of an easy boat trip around the Mediterranean. He, he has no delusion. Um, Paul even states in verse 10 that there would be loss. There would be loss of cargo. There would be injury to life. Um, and if you read this text, if you read all of chapter 27, you will see Paul, uh, Dr. Luke, using words like difficulty. 
um, great concern. Um, he used the little phrase there, um, there were violent storms. It was no small tempest. Um, it also says, Later on in, in verses 27 um, and, and following, that they even went without food. Paul had to encourage them um, and order them, basically, to, to eat. Um, and they even, get this, they even, in uh, verse number 20, they even abandoned thoughts. They abandoned the thought of being saved. And so what we need to understand about the Bible is the Bible is very real. And at this point in the text, um, there was no, by the time we get to verse 20, there is, no prop, there is no promise of earthly safety. There is no hope of physical rescue. But the Apostle Paul does not reach for the life vest. Um, he doesn't tell everybody to jump overboard, let's swim back to Sidon. Paul keeps the faith. Paul keeps the course. And I think that if we're honest, I think a lot of times we believe that life should be trouble-free, that life should be void of inconvenience, that we should not have to um, endure suffering in this life. Um, and if we are really honest, now let's be honest, I think sometimes we think we deserve to be trouble-free in life, that we deserve, it's an entitlement um, not to have um, inconvenience. It's our right not to suffer. But just a cursory reading of the book of Acts um, dispels these notions. Even though sometimes we think we're entitled to have a very easy, cushy life, when you read the Bible, the opposite is true. The Bible tells us um, that we will um, suffer in this life, that we will endure hardships, especially for the believer. In 2 Corinthians, Paul, this is a familiar passage, Paul uh, has a thorn in the flesh. We really don't know what this thorn in the flesh um, was, um, but we know that it caused suffering in his life. And Paul prayed three times for the Lord um, to take the um, thorn away, but the Lord comes back every time. Paul, my grace is, is sufficient for you. Um, and then life was not easy for our Lord. Um, the Bible um, tells us that Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. He was tempted in every way uh, like we are tempted. Um, he paid the atoning sacrifice for our sins um, on a very cruel cross. Praise his name. And so if we lose sight of the fact that um, an easy life is not guaranteed to us, and the Bible teaches us um, that we will endure hardship, if we lose sight of this, um, when hard times come, we will panic. Uh, we will lose faith. And if you are like me, um, what I do when I take my eyes off the Lord and when my disappointment gets the best of me, I panic. I lose faith. And what I do is I try to take control of my own life. I forget the fact um, that God is in control and that he is sovereign. And so even though Paul may have been tempted to despair, and some people believe that he probably was in despair, um, Paul stays course. He keeps the faith. And there are two things that I just want to draw out of, um, out of chapter 27. Number one um, is God is in control. I just want to reread um, verse 22 through 26, just, just real quick. Paul says, yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the loss of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God, to whom I belong and to whom I worship. And he said, this angel of the Lord said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. We must run aground on some island. And so Paul gets a revelation from, I believe, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, because Paul believed and uh, belonged uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul worshiped Christ and Christ alone. And so he receives this revelation from our Lord, and the Lord said, no one's going to die. Um, the ship 
will perish. Um, but Paul, you must stand before Caesar. That was God's sovereign will that Paul stand before Caesar. And so God is in control. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. I have heard this a thousand times over the past um, several weeks. But I tell you what, we need to hear it a thousand more times. We really need to hear it. I need to hear it a thousand times, a thousand times. Um, in fact, the, one of the greatest messages um, that we can uh, receive from God's Word is that God is in control. The Bible reinforces this over and over and over from Genesis chapter 1 to the fall. I mean, all down the line, God is in control. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we look back and we see, yes, indeed, God was in control and God is in control and God shall be in control. And so Paul receives this revelation from the Lord. And um, and I know some people say, well, Aaron, you know, you know, I, I wish I could receive a revelation like this from the Lord. Um, well, you have. This is the sixth of Paul's revelations recorded in the book of Acts, the sixth. Um, and it's probably a, a neat thing to receive a direct revelation from the Lord. Um, but we have to remember that the whole Bible is a revelation to us. The entire word of God is a revelation to us. Many times we forget that. Many times we look at Paul, we look at some of the writers of Scripture, some of the characters of Scripture, and, and we just think, man, if God would just come to me, and if God would just give me a word, a rhema like that, he has. And it's called the Word of God. And the Bible tells us this revelation from God in Acts chapter 27 and, and all the other passages of the Word of God Number one, that ease of life, comfort of life is, is not guaranteed. We've established this already, um, and I'm still learning this lesson. Ease of life, a cushy, comfortable life is not guaranteed. It's not. And number two, the Bible teaches us that we will not lose our lives. Um, you might say, what? We, we will not lose our lives. Nope, we will not lose our lives. Um, as a pastor, I have heard many times brothers and sisters um, of faith receiving the diagnosis of terminal. Um, and this has always seemed contradictory to me. I know it's a medical term and sometimes it has to be used, um, but it's, it seems very contradictory to me that um, the word terminal or terminus will be used to describe the Christian life. Um, again, if you take your handy-dandy dictionary and you look up the word terminal, it means the end. Um, it means it's over. It's complete. Um, it means that uh, the bus or the plane has reached the last station. But according to the Word of God, for the believer, there is no terminus. There is no end for the believer. And the final station for us is eternity with Jesus Christ our Lord because he is risen. Amen? He has risen and we serve a living God and because he lives, we shall live. We will not lose our lives. Um, those family members that have gone on before you um, in Christ, you have not lost them. You know exactly where they're at because of the testimony of the word of God. And so there's two things um, that we need to remember about uh, God being in control. Number one, even though God's in control, uh, we do not have a guarantee of an easy life. Jesus put it this way. In John chapter 11, Jesus is approaching the, the tomb or the grave of Lazarus, his friend. And on the way to the grave, Jesus meets up with Martha, Lazarus' sister. And Martha's in panic mode. Um, she's desperate. And Jesus reminds her in John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Hallelujah. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. You know what Jesus is saying? If we put our belief and trust in him and put our faith in him, we will not lose our lives. 
because our lives will be in Jesus Christ. Paul put a, a different nuance to it, just a little bit, in Philippians chapter 121. Paul, um, on the basis and the authority of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Paul says, um, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, what Paul is not doing when he says that, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, Paul's not whistling past the graveyard. Paul's not making light of suffering and disease and hardship. No, Paul is standing firmly on the authority of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If my life is hidden with Christ and I've been raised with Christ, then for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. John Elefante, um, the former lead singer of the rock group Kansas, uh, came to Christ, and after he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he became a Christian recording artist and a Christian um, producer. And several years ago, he released an album with a song on it entitled, And This Is How the Story Goes. That's the name of the title, And This Is How the Story Goes. I just want to give you just a sliver of the lyrics of that song. Elefante writes, and this is how the story goes, and you must believe it all, my friend, from the beginning to the end, because everyone, everyone lives forever, but we must choose where, my friend, because the virgin had a son and the stone was rolled away. How can we be terminal? Because he lives today. God is in control. Even though we might have hardship and suffering, uh, because life may get tough, and life may get tougher for us. We need to hear a thousand times a thousand that God is sovereign and God is in control. The second thing is, not only is God in control and not only is he sovereign, but we are responsible. We are responsible to be obedient to this glorious and beautiful sovereign God. Um, by responsibility, what I mean is, um, is not that we go out and we do whatever we want to do. Um, I don't mean that we go out and we, and we do what we feel like is right. This is important. Our obedience and our responsibility is based on the Word of God, not our feelings alone not convenience, not our reason and our intellect alone, even though God can use feelings and emotion. Uh, we all know that God can use, I hope he can use our, our reasoning skills and our intellect, but our obedience and our responsibility is not predicated upon our feelings alone. That would be a, a horrible life. But our obedience and our responsibility this, to the sovereign God um, is based on the Word. I'll just go back to the text in verses 21 through 25. Um, uh, the sailors and the Apostle Paul are obedient to the revelation that Paul received from the Lord. Um, and not only that, but we see that the uh, sailors and Paul, they spring into action. Um, uh, they take responsibility. They don't just lay around the ship thinking, well, God's got this under control. I'll just lay here. No, um, uh, Paul encourages them to eat. Uh, your life is going to be spared, but you need to take responsibility and you need to keep your strength up. Um, not only that, but they lightened the ship in verse number 38, if you'll read that. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. And so they just didn't lay around saying, well, God's in control. We don't have to do anything. No, they took responsibility. They ate. They regained their strength. The Bible says, and when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship. They threw cargo over the side of the ship. It says they, they let down four anchors to secure the ship. And so this is showing us that God is in control and that God is sovereign. But we need to be obedient to the word of our Lord. That's our responsibility. And this should be obedience that's based on love, uh, based on the grace and the mercy um, and the forgiveness that Christ has shown us through the cross and resurrection. Um, and, and what happens when we, when we lean on our own understanding, um, whenever we do it our way, what feels right, um, it leads to fear and it leads to panic. And we've seen a lot of this the last couple of weeks, haven't we? 
whenever we rely on our own understanding, whenever we rely solely in our emotions, um, sooner or later, um, that will bring us to fear and panic. Um, in that ancient book, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, lean not, lean not on your own understanding, um, but look to the Lord, acknowledge Him, um, and He shall direct your path. And so if God is in control, and we are not terminal, and we're not, brothers and sisters, based on the resurrection of Jesus, if we are not terminal, this should produce in us a good courage to follow God, a good courage to be obedient to our living King, no matter what the circumstances. Um, and it would do us well to go back uh, through the book of Acts and see how the apostles um, rely, in the early church just relied on the sovereignty and the control of God, but yet at the same time, um, they were obedient. Um, they were responsible and they took good courage. And so before I end, let me just say, God is in control. Let us hear it a thousand times and let us rejoice forevermore. He is in control. Now, in closing, I would just like for us to consider um, how Martin Luther um, embraced this theology. There's Eric Metaxas's book on Martin Luther. Good book. In August the 2nd, 1527, uh, the bubonic plague hit Wittenberg, Germany. That's where Martin Luther lived. Um, and this was not the only time that a plague had broken out in that area. Uh, 200 years before, uh, the Black Death, we've all heard of the bubonic plague and the Black Death. 200 years before, the Black Death had emerged and continued to reemerge periodically. Um, some say that there was a significant breakout or outbreak uh, every nine years from the 1490s all the way to the 17th century. So disease and plague um, was never far from the European mind. It was never far from the European memory. And so on August the 2nd, 1527, the bubonic plague broke out once again in Wittenberg, Germany. Um, but Martin Luther refused to leave. Um, he refused to leave because um, he was a pastor and he had a compassionate heart and a love for his people. Um, and so he didn't leave. And I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, I believe that one of his daughters may have perished, uh, may have died um, because of this disease. And afterward, Martin Luther wrote a very interesting tract to his friend, uh, Johann Hess, of Breslau. Johann Hess was a reformer and theologian as well. And the track is entitled, Whether Christians Should Flee the Plague. Whether Christians Should Flee the Plague. And I just want to read this to you. And I just want you to, to hear this and to see how contemporary uh, this is for us today. And, and I'll close. This is Martin Luther from his track to his friend, Johann Hess, on whether Christians should flee the plague. He says this. He says, no, my dear friends, use medicine, take potions which can help you, fumigate your house, fumigate yard and street, shun persons and places wherever your neighbor does not need your presence or has recovered, and act like a man who wants to help put out a burning city. What else is the epidemic but a fire, which instead of consuming wood and straw devours life and body? You ought to think this way. Very well. By God's decree, the enemy has sent us poison and a deadly offal. Therefore, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate and help purify the air, administer medicine, and take it. Did you hear what he just said? He said that he will pray and ask God to protect us, and then he shall fumigate, help pure the air, and administer medicine, and take it himself. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he surely will find me. And I have done what has expected of me or what he has expected of me. And so I am not responsible for either my death or the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash 
nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. I think the operative phrase there in this, and, and there's a lot more to this track. You can go online and you can read it. Um, there's some things I disagree with a little bit, but I tell you what, this is powerful. Um, and this is very contemporary to us. And I like what he said. We shall pray to the sovereign God who is merciful to protect us. God is in control. Um, but as we pray, we will fumigate. We will purify the air. We will pass out medicine. We will take medicine. And if God should wish to take me, he will find me. He will find me. And so what does Acts chapter 27 teach us? A couple of things. Um, life is not fair, but God is sovereign and he is in control. So take your medicine and wash your hands. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Edward Rowe Baptist Church, I love you. I love you very much. Um, and I'm praying for our church. I'm praying for our community. Um, as we go through this very strange and odd and difficult time. Um, but God is sovereign. He is sovereign. And he loves you more. See you Sunday. God bless.